What is up, folks? It's the Emulsion Podcast, hosted by chef and media producer Justin Kana. That's me. The Emulsion is a result of my desire to educate, share, and personally keep myself up to date on stories stirring up the restaurant industry. I also sit down and interview remarkable professionals that are making exciting moves in their own unique and creative ways. Fine dining, chef swaps, new gear, critiques, professional performance, balance, hospitality, as well as the occasional rabbit hole are all just a few of the topics we get into here. But the goal, of course, being that you take off your headphones or get out of your car feeling smart more inspired or more connected than when you pressed play. Where is the long ad read? You will not find that here because the growing gang of amazing folks on Patreon make it possible for me to hit the publish button every single Thursday and I'm eternally grateful for their support. But more on that after the show. Oh, hello there. Thank you so much for being with me here today. That intro you just heard, that might be the last time that you hear that intro. Believe it or not, I am uh, in the process of switching music providers. And I think it was the first time when I heard my, quote unquote, my, I mean, it's not really my song, but it's like what I know to be the Emulsion podcast intro song on somebody else's piece of content. I was like, eh, I don't really like that. So um, barring me reaching out to a musician and having something created custom for the show, which is like, you know, big budget goals down the line. Uh, that's not quite where we're at yet. I would I would like to get there someday, but we're unfortunately not there yet. But um, just wanted to give you a heads up so you can prepare your ears for a new intro and just a shorter kind of like monologue from me uh, going forward because I'm actually streamlining a bunch of things which you're going to hear about in this episode. So welcome. What's up, folks? Thanks for being here. Uh, I do have a today's beverage. It is a orange LaCroix for the uh, video people. Can uh, flash that there. The This episode in particular, it's, it's a new year. It's a new episode of the podcast, but it's not a new format for me to do. This is the third kind of playbook, quote unquote, that I've created and that I've brought into the world and that I've shared publicly uh, with my learnings from the year prior and then just kind of like a heads up of what I'm thinking to in the next calendar year. Uh, my birthday is at the end of the year and then usually there's kind of a moment when there's like this big rush of holiday things for cooking related projects that I do towards the end of the calendar year. And then right around my birthday, and then the calendar flipping, and then also having this time off from work, I take this time to be kind of complementative and just think through goals and what's worked and what's not. And, you know, where's my energy going in good and bad ways. And so I wanted to suggest that there's a couple ways you can listen to this episode. Um, and this applies to all of the previous uh, playbooks where they have article kind of uh, companions. So you can absolutely just listen to this episode as a standalone piece, or I think a fun way to do it might be to use this as the kind of audio article in the same way that you would use. Amazon did that to me the other day. They say I bought a book on my Kindle and they suggested that I buy the audiobook version of it because I guess people read like that. So they'll have the book on the on a Kindle or the paper copy, but then they'll have the audiobook in their ears and they'll listen to it as they're reading it. And apparently that increases comprehension. Um, but the article itself is not done yet. I'm recording this as a way to kind of talk through the article. And I basically just have a bunch of linking to do. That's the, the last thing. I want this to the I want this article to be hyperlinked to the T. I want there to be everything that you could have wanted to explore more on or double click on. You can go to the website or go to the person to follow them or everything that I mentioned, I want to be hyperlinked. So think show notes on steroids and that's what I need to do. But then I also want this to be, I like audiobooks like that where the re, the author reads it, but then also adds their own little quips into the piece. So let's just start. Let's, uh, let's go into it. So uh, I start off by saying a word to the reader. These playbooks go against what I believe in regarding self-development. So sharing these results and goals and hacks are more for me than they are for you. And I enjoy reading other people's year-end reviews. Actually, this year was a fantastic year for other people's year-end re re reviews like Tiago Forte and David Perel and Ali Abdal, who else wrote really good year-end reviews. Anyways, I, I like other people's resolutions and things like that because I like doing the work to figuring out their underlying motivations and their mental models and their principles and frameworks that people follow to achieve their goals. It's not necessary. I'm not the kind of copy and paste style person. I haven't been for a while now now that I've kind of like 
expanded beyond having a quote unquote traditional job. And so I, I like the kind of Frankensteining of, of goals and to see what other people prioritize. Also, it gives me the mental framework to see what people two rungs on the ladder ahead of me are thinking about. People who have kind of like built out teams or who have an assistant already or who have really successful content production or personal brand style things. I like to nitpick stuff from them. So if you're the type of person to do that work, please enjoy this article. Like, that's how I lay it out. This is a very selfish piece. This isn't, you know, 10 steps to having a great 2021. This is this is what I'm working on. Uh, and so I share, if this seems like a self-centered and rambling piece, that's more or less the point. I'm also really, really excited to always write these playbooks because it's my one chance to indulge in my focuses outside of being a professional chef and developing professional chefs and helping them perform better and nerding out on gear for the year. That's, you know, the other 360 days of the year. This is kind of like I spend almost a week writing this piece and I, I just really enjoy sharing it because it's something beyond what I normally kind of share. I don't talk that much about lifestyle on the channel or in the podcast. I mean, there's a few sections where I do, but I think you folks know what I mean. And what's fun is this also serves as a meta exercise for me to share what's helped me grow. So since I do it publicly and I only get to do this once for 2021, I'm forced to keep stakes and identity in mind, two things that people often talk about with habit formation, making the stakes. So, um, you know, if you don't end up going to the gym, you pay your friend a hundred pounds and they get to, or a hundred dollars and they get to do, donate it to a charity that you don't support, you know, uh, things like that. And then identity is something that I tie into goals. That's talked about pretty frequently in those habit building circles. Um, I make it, it, it makes it much more likely that I'm going to stick to this stuff, right? Because I'm saying it publicly. I'm not just kind of like doing it behind the scenes or, you know, I, I obviously have private goals that I, that I stick to, but you know, things that I want to put out into the world, um, I think that's that's really important. So I also selfishly enjoy looking back at the previous editions. The first two weren't necessarily the case, but now that I can look back, you know, four years onto the one that I wrote in 2017, I like seeing how my thought process has changed and my writing has evolved and how I've gained a sense of focus in my work and life. And I'm hoping that I can see the trajectory of this over, you know, the next 10 years as I write these. So, you know, if my life seems really scattered or that I'm, you know, really working on a ton of different projects, I'd like to see that kind of like pare down, get focused, um, more deep work in my life, more being present, all of that kind of stuff. So I do link to the previous editions in the article if you want to check out 2017's version. I skipped 2018, 2019 I definitely did, and 2020 was just, you know, kind of like I was traveling uh, at the beginning of that year, and then I just, I, I did like an update vlog, but there isn't a 2020 uh, playbook, and I'm really glad that I didn't write one because I... All of that would have had to get thrown out with the bathwater, unfortunately. So this edition itself of the playbook breaks down into different sections in previous years. This breaks down into health, wealth, family, work, hacks, and favorites. So this is just kind of like my tactics, uh, favorite websites, favorite um, blogs. Uh, oh, and there's a worth following section too. So maybe in the final piece, I'll combine those two of like, uh, Instagram accounts I like to follow, email newsletters I read every single week, stuff like that. So please enjoy, and I, of course, link to the audio version of this now. So let's get into the health section. My interest in improving and optimizing my health started in 2018 when both of my parents received some pretty sobering diagnosis. Previous to then, I would always answer the family history health questionnaires with like NA, or I would just put none on any sort of kind of chronic or diagnosable conditions. Now, unfortunately, I have to aff affirmatively mark cancer and Parkinson's. So during my quest to find the most long-term and sustainable preventative measures, many of which I covered in my 2019 playbook as I was kind of really getting into exercise, and I think I talked a little bit about mental health, but I also talked about my diet, which I was, you know, kind of keeping top of mind and trying to stay focused on. But this year, I've really taken to heart the principles the principles of Dr. Peter Atia. I've watched all of his lectures. I've listened to almost every single podcast episode he puts out, even though a lot of it is kind of like way over my head because uh, I'm not a medical professional. But um, I like his principles. I think he's done some incredible work on the relationship between health span and lifespan because it's not just the goal to live longer. The goal is to be healthy longer and be able to do everyday tasks longer. And many of his principles 
principles exclusively seek to extend my window before I receive similar diagnosis because he's done a lot of work saying that, uh, well, I say it here. He shares that centenarians who die, who live to be over 100, they don't die for different reasons than people that pass in their 70s and 80s. They're just better at delaying the onset of neurodegenerative, heart-related, and cancer-forming issues. So assuming that the genetic odds are not in my favor, I should be following a similar protocol, or at least I'm going to try. So here's what I plan to change or continue. So the first one is an eight-hour feeding window. So if truly delicious pastries are off the table, which ha they have been without my normal travel schedule, that's like my favorite thing in the world is to wake up in a new city and go get a coffee and a pastry at a, at a new pastry shop. Um, aside from that, I don't really crave breakfast. It's not really my thing. Um, so since I also prefer to train in the morning and I like to do so on an empty stomach, I will often push out my training because I like to, tr if I eat, I need about an hour. It's like the old lifeguard analogy with swimming. I need about an hour to digest. And I feel like that kind of, what do I do in that hour? You know? So I like to do so on an empty stomach so that I don't eat breakfast and then feel like I have to kind of like sit around and wait, answer emails or whatever. So eating my first meal at around 10 a.m., and then Anna getting done with work at around 5, so we eat around 5.30, like, that's the window. You know, 10 a.m. to 6 is when I eat, and that's just kind of how it works for me. I, I don't really have to do anything um, special. It's mostly bookended by those two routines. So if I get done with training at, you know, 9, um, and then I kind of eat breakfast at around 10, and then stop eating at around six. I don't need to use an app or a timer to track those things. And I don't beat myself up if I, you know, have a bag of popcorn at 7.30 p.m. or if, you know, Anna eats breakfast and I want to have the other half of her bagel in the morning, you know, like that's at 7 a.m. That's not the worst thing in the world. But for the most part, an eight-hour feeding window works really, really well for me. I would like, I think, to try fasting. Uh, let me just type that in here. I would like to try... Um, I like 48 hour fast in 2021 only because just to see how my body responds, I'm not necessarily doing any blood work, uh, to kind of really track those things, but just be curious, uh, to try it, especially because my relationship with food is so close. On that note, the next point is higher quality food intake. So I want to move past the mindset that, you know, in the past, this past year, two years or so, I would always tell myself, you know, I worked really hard today. I deserve to not cook for this meal. And the other kind of like other little devil on my shoulder would say like, you know, you're a chef. You should only be eating delicious things like, you know, you, you can appreciate deliciousness, so you should go for those things versus, you know, being disciplined with your diet and kind of only eating, you know, when you should be eating like a salad that day or a grain bowl or eating oatmeal for breakfast instead, you know. So with both of those running as kind of apps in my stomach brain connection as I write, I, I end up with too many tabs from McDonald's and Bonchon on my monthly credit card statement. And so if I'm going to be the one to tout my skills as a chef for being able to take ordinary ingredients and make them delicious, that should translate to continuing to build out a repertoire of my favorite dishes to cook at home. So for me, you know, like breakfast frequents like almost every single day is like a spinach and blueberry and spirulina and chia seed and turmeric and oat and protein powder shake for breakfast or sometimes I'll make like a kale and mushroom omelet on other days for variety. Um, and then all other meals I try to follow, and this is linked to Jeff Cavalier's plate clock framework, where certain sections of your plate um, look in a certain way to kind of make up the macros versus like individually tracking how many grams of carbohydrates did you eat every day. Um, and that's just to make sure that the balance for me stays consistent. Otherwise, I will end up with a fat plate of pasta three nights a week, even though Anna and I are having pasta tonight, and I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, weightlifting. So one of the most meaningful skills that I built out over the past two years for myself is building my capacity to lift on the standard compound movements. So I started with the goal to reach my body weight, which is 175 pounds on the bench press, a 175 pound squat and 175 pound deadlift and have since made new benchmark goals on top of that. So this is two years in the making. This isn't like something that I, you know, started at zero and January 1st of 2020, and then at the end of 2020, I was, 
you know, here, this is two years in the making. It's taken me a lot of time to make sure I don't injure myself, to make sure my form is good, to slowly kind of progressively overload to get to this point. So for 2021, I share the goals that I'd like to reach a 400 pound deadlift, a 335 pound squat, and a 295 pound bench press. I have set these based on wanting to see a realistic increase. So um, this isn't like I want to kind of double my weights. I'm wanting to basically see 20% increases from my current PRs. So currently I have a 365 pound deadlift. I shared that on my birthday, a 285 pound squat and a 265 pound bench press. I personally have a hard time believing that I would see any sort of marginal increase in my happiness or my overall health by going beyond that. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do with a 450 pound deadlift, but you know, the 400 pounds is more or less kind of like that 2.2 times my body weight goal. Um, and also if I gain some muscle this year and trying to reach the other ones, I want to make sure that my deadlift continues to track, uh, with that and the time commitment to, you know, maintaining those kind of those strength targets is just like, it's not really of interest to me. Like, I don't want to be spending like hours and hours and hours in the gym trying to like, uh, get up to a 325 pound bench press. That just doesn't, that I don't know if that would actually make me happier. So once I hit those numbers, it's basically a game of reverse engineering those goals to hit Peter Atia's centenarian Olympics. So his name comes up again, his centenarian Olympics are, uh, linked there. But you know, for people who don't know, it's something along the lines of like, I want to be able to, uh, squat down and pick up a kid, which is like, you know, 30 to 40 pounds. I want to be able to like carry two heavy bags of groceries down the stairs or up the stairs, I think is what he says. These kind of like very practical day to day life things. And so once I hit the goals, it's basically like I project it out to when I'm, you know, hopefully 80 years old and then making sure that I continue to maintain from there. Um, I've also kept full body weightlifting routines uh, versus the kind of like push-pull leg split, the kind of like bro split that people talk about. So on any sort of day, I will do leg exercises, um, push exercises, and pull exercises versus having like a specific leg day or a specific bench press day, if that helps. So that leads me into the next kind of aspect of my workouts, which is mobility and flow. So I write that if all of that strength is easy to see in the mirror, and it's absolutely fun to track through breaking PR numbers, but if it's horribly lacking and dangerous uh, in the mobility sector, that's not really uh, all that balanced, quote unquote. So I do want to continue to prevent injuries, like I said, and be pain-free later in life. And I, I did see this awe-inspiring video of a guy doing what's called a flow workout or a primal movement workout on TikTok uh, one day last year. And I've since dug into learning about that. So, um, you know, for me, that means a lot of routines from Tom Merrick and Bodyweight Warrior. It means a lot of videos from Yoga with Tim. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be doing these kind of like really flowy, like on my hands, uh, doing handstands types of things. But, you know... Being able to touch my toes, I think, is a great goal and something that I'm, you know, certainly going to work for uh, going into this year. So I do leave my kind of like uh, workout routine. Uh, I am working out six days a week these these days, which absolutely helps my sanity. But, you know, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays is weightlifting in the gym. Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, alternate between running and yoga or that kind of primal movement. And then Saturday, I do a corrective day in the gym. So that's, you know, face pulls, weighted pistol squats, Turkish get-ups, hip work, uh, Jefferson curls, all to kind of like strengthen my hamstrings and my hips and my shoulder mobility and all of those sorts of things. And then on Sundays, I'll either take a rest today or Anna and I will do kind of like a light hike or a nature walk, you know, do some forest bathing. I write that I've fallen into this incredibly greased groove with this routine, and since it maps to my longer-term goals, I will continue the trend this year. I'm not really looking to change up my exercise or training routine uh, for 2021. Moving on to mental health, I'm still using Sam Harris's Waking Up app for mindfulness practice. I've challenged myself in the last month of 2020 to increase my meditation time from 10 minutes to 20 minutes. So that's a new change. And I realized after that kind of experiment that yes, I was able to consistently take 10 minutes to become, you know, all the things he talks about being aware of your thoughts, tracking your patterns, calming down, 
However, I find a massive difference in the mental unwinding that happens by just doubling the duration, so going from 10 minutes to 20 minutes. And shout out, tweet at me if you have the same experience, because it was really profound for me. And the analogy that I draw is an exercise analogy. If the picture the standard 10-minute meditation being like, you know, a trainer saying, I want you to run on this track. Like I want you, it's a paved track. It's flat. You know, it's just turn left, you know, just like keep running around this track. Um, and the 20 minute routine, I analogize to, you know, an hour of trail running, you know, like the, the act of meditating in both is the same in the same, in the same sense that you're running on a track or you're running on a trail, but the time spent under tension and the terrain that you experience and the shorter periods of kind of like increased intensity make it a new thing entirely. So uh, at the time of writing this, I was on a six day streak of 20 minute med- uh, meditation sessions. Um, and I wanted to make I, I do want to make that the new standard in 2021. So I think I'm on a four day streak uh, right now. I think I missed a day uh, last week. Anyways, Another point that I think falls under this heading, the mental health heading, is anxiety. I I certainly know that I'm not alone in people who have seen an uptick in their levels of anxiety in 2020, but I've done a lot of kind of introspective work through the meditation to kind of see the root of it and find uh, what's, what's causing that. So what I've learned and what I hope to carry into this year is my relationship with procrastination and my emotional investment into my work. Those are kind of like the two things that I've identified contribute the most towards my anxiety. So what I write here is how the typical cycle uh, looks for me in getting, uh, you know, larger than normal levels of anxiety. So how it works for me is I will say yes to a thing, then I will become emotionally invested in a successful outcome. I think that's pretty normal. Uh, then because I want the adrenaline rush, I want to kind of crush it out just before the deadline. Like I want to feel that, you know, basically how I felt, you know, working on the line in restaurants where you're just kind of like, you're, you're really in a, in a flow, you're, you know, maxing out your skill set. you're showing people, you know, what you're capable of. And what that leads to is since I don't dig into the work right away, that increases my anxiety about the outcome. And then my emotions intensify around the project. And then I leave a quote in here of David Perel's definition of procrastination, which is coping with challenging emotions and negative moods. That's what procrastination is. It's not pushing things out. It's you coping with challenging emotions and negative moods. So then the procrastination leads to more anxiety. And then ultimately that leads to a rushed and lower quality outcome or a situation where I'm so emotionally twisted up with the work that no amount of success would justify the means. So if I you know, pour all this time and anxiety into a video, even if it does 100,000 views, it's like, was that worth it? Is that how I want to be working? Um, so all questions that I've kind of been digging into. So this is all summed up very elegantly as he does by James Clear. And the kind of little bit that I write is action relieves anxiety. And the full quote is working on a problem reduces the fear of it. It's hard to fear a problem when you are making progress on it. Even if progress is imperfect and slow, action relieves anxiety, end quote. And so the goal for 2021 for me is more action, obviously, Uh, acknowledging anxiety when it arises. I think I've done a really good job at being able to spot that from a mile away. And of course, not ignoring the emotional involvement, but accepting it as part of the process, right? He says in that quote, if if progress is imperfect and slow. So that to me, the the kind of like counterpoint, the balance of that is, is patience and accepting imperfection is kind of like part part of the process. So you can see more about my plans for how I plan to use my time in the work section of the playbook, which, you know, you're obviously going to get to uh, later on in this podcast. So I do leave a bit in the health section about alcohol consumption. And, you know, I know I talk about the beginning at the beginning of this about this piece being for for me. But I think that this might provide value if anybody is wanting to kind of like dial in their alcohol consumption in 2021. So I write that I was really surprised to hear Chris Williamson. He's the host of the Modern Wisdom podcast, and he has a bunch of reasons for being sober. It's linked. I was surprised not just because he's using sobriety as a productivity hack, but he himself is a nightclub owner. And so he ha- he's more or less surrounded by this stuff. And I think chefs deal with the same thing. 
where because you're in a restaurant, your tasting menu goes with wine, you know, there's, you're working with bartenders, all this sorts of stuff, like where alcohol is there, but the ability to kind of like stay sober or not just reach for it as, as a thing, you know, at the end of your day or as part of your time off, I think is, it was really like, I was really impressed by that. And so I wanted to kind of double click there. And he shares that drinking in excess and spending copious amounts of money to do so take away three things. They take away your disposable income, they take away your disposable calories, and they take away your disposable time. And so on each three of those, for income, you could be investing that money or paying down debt that you have uh, or not feeling so much financial pressure. On the calorie front, those disposable calories, like that could be put putting you closer to your weight loss goals or give you more calories to eat foods that you love without guilt or gaining any weight. And then for disposable time, this isn't re- directly referring to the time spent drinking because I think that those points, like I'm not saying you just become a monk that stays inside and you don't do anything social in your life, but the he he talks about the wasted mornings and afternoons that are spent, you know, quote unquote, recovering from the previous night's activities. That's the disposable time that you're losing when you kind of drink in excess. And I think that's, a, that's an important asterisk to add. So I always struggled kind of explaining to people why I didn't enjoy using alcohol as a way to blow off steam. But now I have this. This is like a very clear way for me to articulate why I don't really enjoy drinking in excess frequently. Like I don't need to go out every single weekend. And it's because I hold having extra income and extra time in so much regard. So I certainly plan to continue enjoying alcohol, but in moderation in 2021 through trying new natural wines with Anna. We have two great wine shops that we've been supporting during this time. One is called Ladiv in Capitol Hill, and the other one is a pop-up at a coffee shop from uh, the guys at Juice Club. So they do a lot of really great natural wine. Those are kind of our go-tos. And, you know, when the world gets back to normal uh, in what my business partner calls PPL, post-pandemic life, uh, I will be definitely ordering a glass of wine or two when we go out to restaurants again. So for me, uh, another thing that I add is that for meetings that take place during happy hour, if those end up being a thing this year, I will inquire about zero proof cocktail options from the place that I'm enjoying that happy hour at, or I will challenge the bartender to make like a really delicious version of LaCroix, you know, like put some fun aromatics in there, like, I don't know, grapefruit and lemon verbena, and then put some sparkling water on it. And then I'll drink that. Cause I think every fans of this show know that I love my LaCroix. Um, I talk about supplements. I still take caffeine in the form of Chemex brewed coffee every morning and the occasional Four Sigmatic mushroom coffee. Uh, I'm spotty. I'm not great or consistent with my intake of vitamin D supplements, but I do them sometimes like I took two this morning and I do continue to strive to get the majority of my nutrients from just food, just cooking more at home, lots of vegetables. Um, and then, you know, based on the visits with my doctor, none of my blood work shows that I'm deficient in any sort of vitamins or minerals. So I'm just going to continue the trend. I'm not going to change anything there. And then I do share that I, I bought a little sample pack of alpha brain from on it. And after taking it for a few days, I can't seem to notice any cognitive enhancement. I think a few of you folks will have to share if you feel differently, but Alpha Brain doesn't really do anything for me. I'd rather just have a cup of nice coffee. It's a little bit more enjoyable to consume, and I can actually notice when the caffeine kicks in. Uh, we're almost there on the health front, I promise. So sleep, my my aura ring, my aura ring here continues to be the best investment I've made in my quality of my sleep, the kind of visual ritual of checking my numbers every single morning. And I also build it into my journaling routine. So um, that creates this, you know, what gets measured gets managed uh, kind of incentive structure. And I gamify the scores so that the goal is always to beat the previous day's numbers. And if I'm feeling really good that day, so if I get like a sleep score of like 92 out of 100, I will typically try to have a harder than normal workout that day, which then of course tires out my body. So then like I have to, you know, my readiness score isn't as good or, you know, like that's the game. And so because that tracks to these other goals that I have in my life, it's just, you know, obviously a win-win. 
So I do kind of, uh, oh, I say for those of you that follow the email newsletter, you will know that I experimented with blue blocking glasses from Raw Optics this summer, and they've transitioned from being on the ritual shelf. So, you know, the thing I do every day kind of routine to the break glass in in case of bad sleeping habits shelf. So, you know, if I'm having issues, I might continue to use them again, but I'll just, I, I, I'm not great at remembering to put them on. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but as long as I can keep my mental health and my exercise routines in check, I don't really seem to have that many issues falling asleep at night, which I'm really, really, really grateful for. And I don't add it in here, but, um, I try to get eight hours of sleep a night. Sometimes it's, you know, seven ish. Sometimes, you know, it's eight and a half hours. Don't usually sleep nine hours. That's, that's rare. <laughs> if I'm like really, really exhausted, I might. But last bit in the health section, I promise, is talking about tennis. So I rekindled my love for racket sports in 2019. I was really hoping to dig into them in 2020. But unfortunately, with a lot of tennis centers having to close, and I, I, I more or less just wanted to keep my in-person time with my typical pickleball buddies to a minimum, I've really, really fallen off of that train, and it's sad. My, my goal is to reach a 5.0 USTA tennis rating. Uh, and so what that means is that you're able to kind of like do certain strokes in a kind of like acceptable way. You can, uh, it talks about your serve, it talks about your footwork game, and that kind of gives you an overall rating. And then based on your rating, that's how you get, uh, paired up in matchmaking in kind of tournaments. So to make sure that that is something that I stick to when the tennis center near my place opens again, I want to invest my time and my money into hiring a professional tennis coach and then, I do write that maybe you will see me doing some competitive matches in 2022. Let's see. I don't, I don't really know if that's going to be the plan or not. I, but I do want to keep calling my friends to play pickleball. There's a park um, just north of kind of like downtown Seattle where it's really, really fun to play. Uh, and it's just fun because it's it's it curbs my competitive cravings as well. I find that I don't get to compete as much as I, you know, enjoy to as an adult because I don't I don't like to compete in food. And I also don't like to compete in kind of like social media style things, but on the pickleball court, you know, that's a great, and I don't game video game that much uh, anymore either, which is a little bit sad, but anyways, uh, the next section is all about wealth. So I want to start this section by sharing a few bullets that have helped me feel more secure about my financial position. I certainly didn't grow up with any mentoring in this arena. Both of my parents have very skewed ways of looking at money individually, and that for better or for worse, forked, forced me to seek out my own learnings and my own principles. So I, in the past, kind of like, when was it? Last summer, I shared all this information with my younger sister to help her build a foundation, hopefully. And I hope to do the same for you if you're in a similar boat. Again, this is not, you know, this isn't financial advice. This is me sharing what principles have, have worked for me. And so the first one that I, that I write here in the wealth section is to acknowledge your financial thermostat setting. So I spent the better part of my career in professional kitchens, and my setting was around $5,000, right? So what happens with a thermostat in a house? If it's too hot, it measures to kind of, it takes measures to cool things down. And if it's too cold, it kicks on the heater, right? So for me, because my setting, I was set, quote unquote, at 5000 whenever I would get above that, since I didn't have any other long-term goals or plans for retirement or anything like that, I would find a way to, you know, buy a new knife or go on a trip somewhere, or I would just end up seeing it, you know, evaporate because I would eat out too much, right? And then on the flip side, if I found myself with $2,000 in my account, which was way lower than where my setting was at, I would find a way to adopt a more frugal mindset or take on projects that made me more money. I would do some freelancing or, or stuff like that. And, and the magic for me happened when I started kind of scoffing at my own self-defined thermostat setting. And I raised it to $10,000. I just said, you know, like, I'm not going to be satisfied until there's $10,000 uh, to, to in my bank account, you know? And what was funny when I did that was that the same behaviors happened, but my net worth increased. And so I guess my question for you, and this can be rhetorical or you can actually take some action on it, is what is your thermostat setting at if you're in a similar boat to where I was, you know, three, four or five years ago? And then what would happen if you were to increase it in 2021? I think that's an interesting thought exercise. Uh, emergency fund. We have to talk about an emergency fund. There's, there's a reason that almost everybody 
preaches having three to 12 months of expenses as step one in financial literacy. And I was not the person to have one, uh, even maybe three years ago, I didn't really have that much money set, set aside for, for emergency times, but regardless of kind of your long-term goals or budget plans or which for personal finance personality that you're following the fund, this emergency fund gives you options. So even if you don't plan on quitting your job with this expense security, 2020 taught all of us that cash cash flow disruption is real, and it's really debilitating when it when it happens and you don't have a backup plan for it. So it's a sobering reality to kind of hear about the percentage of Americans who would go into debt with an unexpected four hundred dollar expense, and I was certainly there. Uh, having what my dad would call a cushion helps you be prepared for those times when when you're experiencing that. So practically speaking to share how I did it, I built mine by putting aside uh, increasing percentages of my paycheck every month. So I started with 10% of my paycheck, then then 20%, then 30%, until I hit six months of an emergency fund, which is kind of like all you, you tally up all your expenses for the month, times it by six, that's your emergency fund goal. And then after I hit the six month goal, then I started investing. So I didn't continue to just pile it cash into that account. I started investing any money on top of that. And then I took the profits from the investing and funneled that into the fund to help it reach the nine month kind of target. And that's where I'm comfortable. For, for you, it might be 12 months. For you, you might be so secure that you are okay just having three months as, as a little cushion. But since I personally have diversified income streams, I'm confident in my ability to kind of pivot my focus. If I lose one contract or if I lose one source of income, I have plenty more things that I can pivot to versus being nervous about losing a singular job. I don't have a singular kind of like employer that I go and work for from nine to five. The next point is to invest in yourself. I find that this gets inaccurately interpreted as spend money on yourself. I don't necessarily think that that's the best way to do things. The best investments in myself that I've made were watching, you know, free YouTube tutorials, reading free articles and listening to free interviews that are posted on the internet with people who are more successful than me. So you can also see the all the, the, the rants that I just went on in the health section, because if you aren't able to perform, in most cases, you aren't able to earn. So investing in your health is, and there's a lot of free ways to do that, um, you should kind of prioritize that first. And a huge amount of this work can be done at an extremely low financial cost when you have more time than money. And the people who you see that are hiring personal trainers and taking online courses and working with business coaches, they're the they're reverse. They have more money than they have time. And so they, you know, spending spending money on themselves is actually a way to buy their time back in a, in a kind of roundabout way. And so think about it like that. Don't think about it as like, oh, I have to have money in order to invest in myself. It's not like that at all. The next point is to embrace compounding. Our our brains, our human uh, psyches are horrible at understanding the logarithmic functions and also taking into account long time horizons. And what I find is that leads to a neglect of what Albert Einstein you know, and this could be a misinterpretation, maybe it wasn't Einstein that said this, but he called compounding the eighth wonder of the world, right? It's this amazing thing that it just works because of math. And there's this fantastic tweet from Anthony Pompliano, and this is linked, where I share the wisdom that he shares the wisdom that anyone can be a millionaire via consistent discipline and a long enough time horizon. And I definitely recommend if you don't believe that, you should click into the tweet and then look at the comments because a lot of those common rebuttals exist there. Uh, and I just recommend that you run the numbers for yourself. Just open a compound interest calculator on the internet, put in $100 a month invested for 30 years at an 8% rate of return, and you'll see that it reaches $136,946.12. The last point on personal finance that I'll add here is to remove the choice via automation. A lot of this I learned from Ramit Sethi, and he has a great book. Definitely recommend everybody read it. I bought it for my sister. Um, I say, human nature falls victim to temptation at the soonest opportunity. So if you leave the task of saving $175 every paycheck towards my emergency fund or 
you know, invest $230 into my Roth IRA account or, you know, pay $85 off of this debt that I owe and you rely on your own personal manual processes to take care of that every single time horizon, every two weeks, every month, you yourself will most likely find other creative and goal disrupting ways to use that money. At least I, I do that. And so I have specific and I've built specific automations through services like Wealthfront and just my, like my bank that I use to make my money disappear. And the second that it hits my account, it's gone. I can't really see it. The processes, the algorithm has already run. And so I remove that choice of where the money gets spent. It's already spoken for. You know, I, I don't get to choose. And it sounds so simple, but with less to spend, I'll spend less. <laughs> you know, like if I see that there's only $200 in my checking account, I'm likely not, you know, motivated to spend any of that money because it's like, oh, shoot, you know, like that that's not a lot you know so this is kind of like an advanced step on the financial thermostat principle but you know it's helped me a lot so I, I wanted to share it here and you know i continue to go on to say if a lot of this is second nature to you congratulations but i can distinctly remember and i'm telling this story because i think it's important i i was offered a 401k plan when i was an employee at the french laundry and at the time i asked my roommate if it was a good idea to enroll in it or not. I didn't know. Um, I didn't know if my parents knew, so I didn't really ask them. And he advised me to do it. He said, yeah, you should absolutely do it. They do an employee employer match. Um, you know, it's basically free money. But at the time, it was the choice of, you know, more money in my paycheck every month or the thought of saving for retirement. And my mindset was I would rather take the extra money and save it myself Spoiler alert, I just spent it. And I basically missed out on years of potential compounding just because I trusted myself to manage those funds versus, you know, trusting dis a disciplined system. And so I regret that quite a bit. And I, I, I share this and I probably will continue to do so because nailing these basics, which which seemed like advanced financial wizardry to me over, you know, four years ago, that gives me the ability to move on to more advanced uses of my money now. So, and I, and I say it because I don't want to share my learnings and wins in aggressive stock market investing or seeking equity in startups or buying vintage Pokemon cards or purchasing real estate or buying Bitcoin without the acknowledgement that I can only do any of that stuff because my bases are covered. I have the basics nailed. So, to share some goals that I won't reach this year, I've shared in the past that becoming an investor and an advisor in early stage hospitality slash food media slash gear focused businesses is an ambition of mine in my 30s and 40s. That's not for 2021. But this chapter of increasing my net worth is kind of part of that process. So I'd like to share that that's what I'm working on. Um, and then the last piece is um, I, ran, I ran the numbers myself on what it is what's beneficial for me of cooking at home. Uh, and this is kind of like another Ramit Sethi ism is that he talks about, um, capitalizing on higher quality experiences and spending more on the things that you love. And so I calculated that between buying groceries and going out to eat every single day for all three meals by cooking at home, Anna and I save something around the lines of like a thousand dollars a month. Um, which is just bonkers. And it's not to say that I don't want to support restaurants. It's just that I don't, I want to be able to continue to go out to nice places uh, without guilt uh, financially. And so there's going to be a lot more cooking at home for me this year. And does that come with content? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it does leave, leave something in the comments or tweet at me if you want to see more of what I cook at home for my wife and I, huh. check it out. New setup. I, thought I was going to be able to get something like this set up uh, yesterday. Sorry for people who aren't watching on video and listening to this as a podcast, but uh, yeah, new setup, new lighting, new day. Let's, uh, let's continue on. 
So the next section is family, and I start off that section with a quote from Harvard Business Review that says, people who are driven to excel have this unconscious propensity to underinvest in their families and overinvest in their careers, even though intimate and loving relationships with their families are the most powerful and enduring sources of happiness. And that's from an article that they posted called, How Will You Measure Your Life? So I officially started a family in 2020. That's kind of like more looking back. I married Anna in October, and we will celebrate being together for 10 years this year in 2021. So after 28 years of this kind of inward focused progress and work on myself, the paradigm has of course shifted. And this timing coincides with a deeper connection to my family on my father's side in India, and I've grown to see them as a huge priority in my life going forward. And I share that the combination of my my mother and my sister, uh, who's you know kind of like 18 months apart from me, they don't feel a connection to India or see value in fostering the relationship. And then combo that with the fact that my father is an only child and doesn't have any siblings to hold a connection to that heritage. And then also, many of my relatives in India, aside from one cousin that I have that lives in the U.S., they've grown up there and they don't travel outside of the country. So a lot of that makes me feel an immense sense of responsibility towards keeping that bond with the culture present through travel and connecting with family and making interaction with India much more of a thing than it was for me growing up. So that's something that I wanna prioritize going forward. Um, Obviously, I don't think that traveling to Delhi is gonna be in the plans for 2021, but I could be wrong, things could change. Speaking of more plans for 2021, kids are not in the plans for Anna and I. We want to enjoy a couple years of uh, just being married without children yet, but it is going to be a part of the next three to five years for us, so that's something that I'm kind of trying to forecast out and think about. Um, we've, uh, we haven't gotten the chance to take a real honeymoon yet either, so we're doing our best to be kind of patient with our timelines. This is one of the sections of the playbook uh, this year that's short. It's the family section is probably the shortest. It's I think it's the second time that family has shown up in these playbooks. And they, as you can see, it, I'm, I'm seeing a trend getting bigger and bigger. Um, the family section growing in importance. And I foresee it ballooning over the next couple of years. I can see this being one of the largest sections of the playbook going forward. Uh, to keep a thriving marriage, we will continue to work in sessions with our therapist who did premarital counseling with us on a, on a less frequent but consistent basis going into 2021. Navigating these changes and these goals that we have for our relationship with a third party has been super, super valuable, and I couldn't recommend it enough. If you're a couple that's thinking about getting married or starting to plan for the future, having someone look at your relationship and talk through things with you from a psychological perspective was really valuable. And for me, it helped me understand my wife better. And it allows her and I to look at conflicts and each other's patterns with much less emotional reactivity. So um, I also share that the hardest part of 2020 was not being able to see my parents as much as I would have liked to. I had immense conviction in my desire to budget time to see them in previous playbooks, but I've had to just kind of settle for calling them multiple times a week in order to protect their safety. Okay, moving on to work. Work was challenging for me in 2020, and I think this is this might be the longest or second longest section uh, of the playbook. I weighed each one of those challenges that I experienced in my work life with the gratitude that I had to the fact that I had available work to do. And 2020 stripped that away for so many. So it was, as much as I, it seems like I'm kind of like ruminating over these things, it's it's under the foundation is gratitude. I'm, I'm super, super happy that I didn't lose my job in 2020 or have to worry about where my next paycheck was going to come from. But facing those challenges has taught me a lot that I plan to bring into 2021. Uh the thing that I share is my time spent working will be divided up between these kind of five buckets is how I'm thinking about them. So the first one is co-founder and executive chef of Voyager's Table. Second one is going to be running my online course, which I'm calling the Demi Skills course. I'll share more about that in a second. Three is hosting the Emulsion podcast. Four is writing content for my website, my email newsletter, the Circle community, and that is kind of like the paid way to support me going forward. And then, of course, the video scripts for the YouTube channel. And then the last bullet is coaching and consulting, which I don't necessarily rely on, but they're really lucrative opportunities. And they also kind of like, they make me feel like the 
kind of explorative work that I do in watching entrepreneurship lectures and social media strategy things and marketing, reading marketing books, uh, all of that can get deployed in these consulting sessions. And overall, with coaching, it, it's it's not something really that scales with my time as well, but I still super see the value of it. And for the people who are wanting to interact with me in that way, I find that it can be really beneficial going both ways because it helps me talk to individual people who are dealing with, you know, one siloed set of problems. And then if I, if my stuff, if my advice works with them, that gives me data, you know what I mean? And then I can use that to hopefully help more people uh, progress. So I took for granted the setup I had in 2019, I think a lot of people did, where I was able to cook sustainably in person by running private events through the business that I co-own, which is Voyager's Table, while simultaneously working on sharing my ideas and growing my personal brand through my own self-published content online. It was the perfect combination of working in person with a team, interacting with guests, and growing a small business while also giving me this kind of dedicated introverted time, like you see right here in front of a screen, to edit videos and write scripts and emails and do online work that scales. You know, I can share a video and it goes out to thousands of people, whereas when I do a dinner, it's maybe, you know, 20 to 60 people. Uh, and that fell to pieces in April. I think that it did, like I said, it did for a lot of people. So for us, we stopped all in-person events. We reduced our team to a kind of skeleton crew and almost every part of our business moved online. I would effectively spend 10 hours a day at a computer and it was driving me insane. All I wanted to do was smash out prep for a dinner or set up a venue for an event to kind of balance out the monotony of living in spreadsheets and Google uh, Sheets and Gmail and you know Word documents. And that more or less came to a head in September, and I share that I had to have a hard conversation with my business partner about taking a step back from the company. It was driving me nuts. I, I couldn't. I didn't feel like I could do it anymore. And what motivated this, what really caused me, it pushed me over the edge. I was kind of like considering it, um, and I heard a line from an interview between Tim Ferriss and Kamal Ravikant that gave me a lot of clarity. So when Tim was making the choice between writing another book or continuing to invest in startups through angel investing, Kamal asked him, and he was really grappling with this, and Kamal asked him which avenue would allow him to have a deeper impact on people, investing or writing, and it was a no-brainer. There is a never-ending list of people who have money to invest, but Tim can, is the only one who can write Tim's books, right? And that insight led to so many positive changes for me. So I, I, I will go on to, uh, after that conversation in September, I would go, I would bait, I remove myself from a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks of, of the business. So I would only work two days a week. That's still kind of the cadence that I'm, that I'm on that might scale back up, uh, as the world continues to open up again and I can cook more in person. And that was really hard, but then at the same time, it allowed the team to learn how to do my work of interacting with purveyors and sourcing product and creating recipe documents and um, putting kits together, right? And we streamlined our offerings for clients too, making, you know, moving away from this reactive kind of custom only model to really creating products that sync with our high level of service for corporate teams who want to gather and entertain their clients, which has been really, really satisfying to see that happen. Because I think the fear when a lot of people uh, feel this kind of working in their business instead of working on their business uh, dilemma is that you think that if you take a step back, everything's going to crumble to pieces. And it was really satisfying to see uh, things actually stabilize a little bit more when I remove myself. And for me, that led to extra time exploring this nebulous idea of intense, scalable, high-end self-development for chefs and professional ones that has ultimately solidified into a course that I'm launching this quarter. So during that process, I hired a coach to help me build this out because I want to do it right and I want to learn from people who have done it before themselves. And when I say that, I mean building these kind of like five to six figure a year coaching and course based products. And I'd like to call to light an error that I made in a previous playbook, actually. Um, and this is more in reference to Voyager's table. I need to kind of move this down. No, I need to move this. Uh, yeah, I need to move this down. Anyways, editing note for myself uh, in the article. That's why I'm shooting this. But basically, the error that I made in a previous playbook was that I wanted to, I, I stated that I wanted to execute a $50,000 event, 
And for me, it was a natural next step, upping the order of magnitude from event budgets. I was doing $500 events, then I moved to doing $5,000 events, and the next kind of adding a zero to that was $50,000. And I knew that I would need the help of a team to scale to to reach that goal, but in booking our first six-figure event for 2020, I didn't take into account the energy suck that would accompany that quote-unquote success uh, level metric, I guess, that I that I had set. And... After we had gotten that event booked and we were starting to plan for it, I agonized about it. I would ruminate over the logistics of the day. I found myself buried in spreadsheets and run sheets and budget documents and staffing plans. And I knew that on that day, I wouldn't, I would barely be doing any cooking. I would be tasked with the important job of managing the chefs that were cooking for the event, but it it wasn't like... In my mind, I would think to myself, wasn't that the reason I left restaurants? I wanted to cook more. I wanted to, um, I wanted to be the one executing on the events more, or or in pop-ups or whatever that looked like. I had basically felt that the managing of a team of chefs could be pushed out to be doing that later on in my career. You know, when I'm 45, I can manage a team of chefs. I don't want to do that now, and. That event was unfortunately, maybe fortunately, canceled due to COVID, and we never ended up executing on it. We were, you know, maybe about a month out from executing it. Everything was set and ready to go, and because we couldn't have that large of a gathering, we ultimately had to had to cancel it. And the lessons learned from that experience will stick with me forever. I'm really, really glad that it happened, but I'd like to share some of those lessons here so that you don't make the same mistakes, hopefully. So the first bullet here is to understand what you're optimizing for. And I think this time of year, it's easy to succumb to the same but more trap of goal setting, right? So if you made X dollars last year, this year, the goal should be X times two, right? Or X plus Y amount. You want to go from $80,000 to $90,000. Or maybe it's not related to dollars. You maybe saw X number of visitors uh, or traffic last year. So the goal should be Y percent more traffic this year. Instead of, um, you know, focusing on growing the number of people in the team, how can you grow the individual members of the team so you keep the headcount the same, but you make it so that they can output more and then they ultimately feel more uh, fulfilled at work? That's kind of a rhetorical question for you to ask yourself as you're thinking about these goals. The next bullet is how you make your money is more important than how much money you make. This is, of course, a Gary Vee-ism. I don't think I realized how important that was until this year. I think we can all acknowledge that there are incredibly, quote-unquote, easy and consistent ways to make money, especially using the internet via simply... um, Doing something like uh, arbitrage, right? You buy something for $3, sell it for $15. Or, you know, an easy and consistent way is is getting a salaried position, getting a job. Um, There's a great video from Colin and Samir where they, it's it's titled, Should We Just Get Jobs? Or something something along those lines as they're contemplating the difficulty that is having something on your own uh, that, that that is focused on creative quality output versus just profitability. However, if you make money the goal, then you are, by definition, deprioritizing other factors that ultimately make work satisfying. So the question that I ask uh, in the article is, how can you take your financial goal and swap it with something that's going to bring you an intangible? These things like deeper connection with your team or an expanded network or more time for family or less pressure. The, and, and the funny thing is, by making that swap, oftentimes the, the result is that the financial rewards come anyways, and you're happier for it in the end. So think about that as you're um, making goals for, the, for this year. The, other, the last bullet here is personal goals versus business goals. So for me, I wanted the clout to be able to say how much to- my time was worth and the magnitude of the projects I was working on. I wanted the ego boost of saying I work on $50,000 events. And what I should have been focusing on is the quality of the partners partnerships that we as a business get to work on, right? I'm also leaning into delegating more in 2021 based on the work of Tim Francis and his company, which is called Great Assistant. I 
don't plan on shelling out the $3,000 for his recruiting service, but I have a structured approach for creating standard operating procedure documents for my frequently done repeatable tasks, right? So I have a finished video file. It needs to get uploaded to YouTube and keyworded and titled and thumbnailed and all those things. Do I need to be the person doing that? Maybe yes, maybe no. But if I can, if, if I can, if it's a repeatable process and there's a checklist style way to do it, um, Tim Francis talks about the idea that as long as the task has sufficient resources, a strategy, and a clear definition of done, it can be delegated. And so my question to the chef's reading is, does your delegation process seem like it can fit within this framework from a traditional office? Uh, You should try to give it a shot, right? So ask yourself, does your team have the resources, a clear strategy, and your objective definition of done in mind when they're working without you over their shoulder, right? Um, I'm also nearing the completion of coming kind of full circle on my rejection that I experienced of the traditional executive chef responsibilities. I made a quip a few years ago in a podcast interview where I'm getting into the core stuff now. So I I made a quip a few years ago in a podcast interview. I think it was with Ray DeLucci on Line Cook Thoughts, where I referenced the fact that I consider myself to be in the top 1% of line cooks in the world. And my frustration came with the fact that I had hit a salary ceiling. So even though I knew that I was world-class on a physical skill-based job where my productivity directly related with the increased quality and quantity of output for the business, which was whatever restaurant I was working in, there just isn't anyone who is paying six figures, $100,000 a year to a line cook, even if they're the best in the world. So... I believe that I've come to a conclusion on why this is so frustrating for me, and I'm about to make a left field analogy, but stick with me for a minute. So I think about the architect who is really good at building those kind of tabletop models of office buildings or apartment complexes or high-end malls, and the model maker is able to quickly produce incredibly accurate, stunning models that consistently bring the vision of their boss, the lead architect, to life. And by showing these models to clients, it impresses them, it encourages them to take on future projects, and they're even able to pick out details of the construction process that can more align with their models. And, but, you know, you and I both know the value of the talented and well-compensated architect. That comes from coming up with the ideas and selling the clients on big lofty visions and coordinating with contractors and sticking to budgets and being willing to put your brand behind the project and ultimately on the line by building an architecture firm that can survive regardless of who is building those little tabletop models. And for me, I was foolish and selfish to think that as a line cook, aka the model maker in this scenario, that I could continue to increase my cooking speed and my effectiveness and my consistency and ultimately demand a higher salary because that's not what demands the higher salary. What I've kind of realized and come full circle on is increased compensation typically comes from leverage, which I learned through reading a bunch of Naval Ravikant's book. Uh, There's a book that's on one of these shelves here. Uh, Eric Jorgensen just came out with a fantastic almanac of Naval's work. When When you are a great line cook, you're a master in the restaurant you work in by being a proxy chef. You're able to take the dishes, the recipes, and the techniques that are taught to you and replicate them day after day for the guest. And for me, that journey was incredibly difficult. It took me years to get to that place. And it was one of the most satisfying achievements of my life when I finally nailed it and felt like a competent and confident and high-performing chef. And you make the transition from cook to chef but there's this level beyond that, which is not no longer about your chef skills, your cooking skills, and much more, almost entirely, about your skills as an entrepreneur and as a leader. And since then, I no longer seek knowledge from famous or well-known chefs to learn about business building. I get more value from entrepreneurs who have built businesses that are much more sustainable or profitable or scale more effectively than restaurants because my disbelief in the standalone restaurant model still holds true. I still don't think it's the best idea to have a restaurant be your only source of income and revenue. However, just because I'm taking knowledge from three to four rungs above me on the ladders of success, that doesn't mean that I can't share value to the people 
one or two rungs below me. I took this from uh, David Perel as well. Each and every one of the abilities and skills that I learned through adapting to all these different environments, going through culinary school and ultimately into high-end restaurants, and you know, mastering different techniques like sauce making and protein roasting and open fire cookery and a little bit of pastry work, and then going into recipe creation and R&D and managing a team of creatives and being able to stay cool under pressure leads to this kind of huge competitive advantage that I feel like I have. So since we've all come to see the benefits of being able to adapt in the face of change, or you know maybe we've flailed uh, attempting to do so, there are these foundational pieces of knowledge that either I learned along the way or I wish that someone would have taught me sooner. And I think we all can acknowledge that techniques, the, the individual recipes, the build-outs of the space, the menu structures, the brigade setups, the prep styles, and even the cuisine changes from restaurant to restaurant or, you know, from restaurant to catering company to cafe to private chef. There are a million different positions available to, to chefs now. So I asked myself, what carries through? What if we all have to relearn each one of those aspects of a new kitchen, so the techniques, the build out, the recipe, the menu structure, the brigade setup, the prep style, the cuisine, if we have to relearn all of that, what do we bring with us everywhere? And that's been the motivation of my mindset taking into developing the course that I brought up earlier. So it's called the Demi Skills course. So it's the French word for half, Demi, symbolizing the other half of skills that are required for peak performance, but they aren't systematically taught. And I use the word skills, it's called the Demi Skills course, meaning that they're able to be taught, they're able to be learned, and that you can improve upon them. So as I write this playbook, I'm in the process of the first set of slides in the curriculum, and there are likely 8 to 12 candidates that will be part of my beta test, my first run through. And I will take those slides, I will teach these slides to those 8 to 10 people, they will get lifetime access to the course, and then the, the, you know, the entire cohort will run through the course together. And then the goal there is to get to a point where I bring in people to teach the course um, as mentors, either people who have graduated and continue to do those things, or I kind of emulsion podcast interview style them, figure out what makes them productive and adaptable in different kitchen environments, and use that to make the curriculum better going forward. I share that to aid in marketing, I will be running a five-day kitchen productivity challenge. It will be free for prospective students to more or less road test my teaching style and see if they're able to deploy the learnings at their workplace or in their school, if they're in culinary school at the time. And if they like that, then they can, you know, that will kind of like lead into um, being kind of like a top of the sales funnel for the course itself. Um, once the full price course launches, I also plan on calculating five to 10% of the total size of the cohort and then offering scholarships based on that amount. So if the cohort is 50 people, there will be five to 10 additional scholarship spots. So there'll be a total cohort of like 55 to 60 people. And that will hopefully make the learnings accessible to as many people as possible while also keeping the focus on scaling the business. So I want this course to be a business in and of itself. And the beauty of this breakdown of kind of segmenting my work into these specific uh, days or projects is that it finally fits into a standard work week for me. I'm hopefully trying to work five days a week, maybe five and a half days a week. And in a previous email newsletter, I shared a trial of a workday template that I was trialing a few weeks ago, and I plan to make that the normal in 2021. It's worked amazingly well for me, and this is how it looks. The folks that are watching this on video must be cheesing so hard because this has been shot in like three separate uh, video things because I record individual like chunks of this in between meetings that I have today uh, and yesterday, so sorry about that. But onto my daily routine as far as like work and life goes. I like to hear other people's uh, daily routines, so here we go. Starting at 6 is usually when I wake up. Sometimes it's 6.30, uh, and what happens immediately going into the day is my morning routine, which I will talk about in a, in a little bit here. Um, from kind of like the end of the morning routine until I go exercise, and because my gym has a little bit of an interesting schedule right now with getting let into the gym, uh, I will fill that time by tackling my email inbox and or reading articles. And I know that that isn't always uh, recommended, but I find that that kind of, you know, start the lawnmower kind of tasks is actually really nice for me to start in the morning. And because it's usually early 
for me, I feel like I can get a leg up on everybody else. And I don't, I don't fall victim to getting buried in my inbox. I actually like to stay a little bit ahead of it. And so that's usually how I'll start my day at around eight. I say eight because sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's eight thirty. I will go to the gym or tr- do my training, go for my run or do my yoga. Then at nine, uh, from nine to nine forty-five, I usually am in phone calls and meetings. Uh, nine forty-five to like ten o'clock, I'll have my first uh, ingestion of food. So that's my breakfast. From ten o'clock to two o'clock, that's my blocked four hours of. Usually, I try to do deep work. On a day like today, uh, it's currently like twelve thirty, and I just had like a one hour long meeting because our team just presents presented a bunch of stuff for us for, you know, kit delivery stuff and meeting uh, event software style stuff. So. It doesn't always work like that, but I find the more days that I can have that 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. blocked off and get writing done, my output is just better. So I can manage to slam through a to-do list. I use a Pareto timer um, on my phone called Forest, which is really, really nice because it gamifies that process for you. And then during my journaling sessions in the morning, I have to tell the journal how many trees I planted the day before, which has been really, really nice. So if you're someone who needs to do a lot of kind of like computer-related work and maybe you don't like it, but you enjoy the idea of doing it in 25-minute sprints, it's a really, really good app to download. I have been trying to um, schedule in walks uh, in my day. So from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, if I can get that 30-minute walk in, that usually gets me close to my activity goal that my my ring tells me that I need to hit. Then from 2.45 to 5 o'clock, it's just you know more meetings, more calls. I'm going to try to schedule all podcast interviews for 2021 during that window. So you know in people's afternoon times, or at least my afternoon times, because... As you can see, I'm usually busy in the morning. And then I also leave that two, three o'clock ish to five o'clock ish in the afternoon time for errands. So if I need to go to the post office, if I need to go to the bank, if I need to go to the grocery store, uh, that's a good time for me to go because it's usually like after I've kind of gone through the blood sugar slump, um, I'm not super caffeinated on things. And, you know, sometimes it works both ways. On my drive to XYZ errand location, I can take a phone call with someone. And so it allows me to kind of multitask even though I'm singularly tasking. And then right around 5.30, 5 to 6-ish is dinner with Anna, which I've already shared. I'm going to be trying to cooking from to cook from home a little bit more. Uh, from 6 p.m. to 9, that is my blocked try to not work, uh, read, relax, play video games, play cards with Anna, um, have phone calls with the family, FaceTime people. Uh, and then right around 9, 9.30, that's when I start my nighttime routine, which includes that kind of 20-minute clean up the house, uh, drink your last drink of water. I'm trying to do like a mobility, flexibility, stretching routine in the evenings. Um, and then also just kind of try to stay away from screens. I'm not always the best at that though. And then sleep at 10. So from 10 PM to 6 AM, that's my eight hour window when I try to get sleep. And then I do share a few things to note on this routine that I've learned about myself through experimentation. The first bullet is it's best for me to knock out a few admin tasks before diving into deep work as a quick warm up of the brain. And since finding a 10 minute inbox categorization routine, that's enough for me to grip what's urgent to respond to. The remaining emails can wait until after my deep work session. So I shared that in an email newsletter. Uh, It's a random person on some sort of like internet productivity forum created this ability to, you know, you go in and you star your emails based on do they need to be responded to? These are reference emails. These are read later emails. And these are, there's another categorization, but you go into your Gmail settings and you, you color code the different stars so that you can just use keyboard shortcuts and go J K J K to go up and down. And then you do S to, to toggle between the different um, tags for different emails. And then for me, like I said, it takes less than 10 minutes to go through, you know, the last 24 hours worth of emails received, categorize them, and then I can, you know, jump into them later. And a lot of them ultimately just end up getting deleted, which is really, really nice. And then the second bullet is I have one deep work session per day. If I can manage to get two, sometimes that's in the window that I share, that is sometimes in the relaxing time of 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., that's a bonus. So for me, protecting that 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. time from all meetings, all interviews, leads to truly truly profound output, and the days when I miss it are the days when I feel like I'm slacking. 
I think that's more or less all I want to share about work. The next section is hacks and favorites, and so I'll just share some of my favorite things that I've been either using to make myself happier, more productive, uh, more present, and just favorite things that I've read or consumed or discovered over the past uh, year and that I plan to carry into the next year. So the first bullet is creating and building my second brain in Notion specifically has been one of the best investments of time that I've ever made. I've watched almost every single free video and blog post from Tiago Forte, who runs a course called Building a Second Brain. Um, and I built a system uh, myself, that, and it works for me. So through planning my own wedding, moving a parent across the country, and keeping track of all of the, their notes, and then keeping track of all my own personal notes from reading books and articles and listening to podcasts, and I use it to outline my own goals and track my gym workouts and plan my content and my day-to-day -day tasks and errands. It's an invaluable part of my life, and I couldn't literally imagine life without it. I'm reading you this script off of Notion, and I use it for a myriad of different um, tasks and organizing my life. I, the, the quote that really made me want to jump into this and build this out for myself and do all the work required to research the different functionalities that I would need is your brain is for having ideas, not holding ideas. And so I also had this big frustration of being able to read a bunch of books or listen to a bunch of things or consume a lot of content, but I, I never scheduled in time to either go back and reference it or be able to use it to create content. So there's a cool integration that I have where I can take a cool quote from a from a video I watch or a podcast I listen to and link it to my content dashboard where I plan out videos. So if I have a quote that I want to influence another vi a video that I'm producing, and that's where I find that um, I jive really well, is I can take things from different industries and bring them to our industry as chefs. So, you know, if we get enough people to listen this far into the podcast or to read this far into the article and request a breakdown of my Notion setup, I will certainly make a video. But at, at the moment, it's kind of like this selfish thing that I use that works well for me uh, to manage my, you know, hurricane of a life. And so, uh, yeah, it's been a really, really high ROI investment for me. The second hack is to make the bookmark you use for YouTube lead straight to either your watch later playlist or your subscriptions. So the goal is to not get caught on the YouTube home screen because it's incentivized to give you a range of options that might strike your mood. YouTube is trying to get you to go down the, the rabbit hole. And what that does is it, it often ropes you into a time suck that you didn't sign up for. And too many people consider, um, you know, the subscription feed is your pre-vetted content. It is the channels and people and companies that you have already told YouTube, this is who I want to hear hear from. And your watch later is the same. So if you don't know, you can like triple dot a video on the drop down. You can say save for later and it will add it to your watch later playlist. And so you're optimizing for that. You want the pre-vetted stuff. And um, you've decided that those videos and content pieces are valuable. So you should go straight there and you avoid the you know trap of potentially going down a rabbit hole. And I'm, I've fallen victim to that a little bit too much in 2020. The next bullet is to experiment by making your training separate from your morning routine. So your workout, your walk, your whatever. It's not to say that they can't bookend each other. So you, it's not to say you can't go from morning routine to training, but having a routine that you can continually stick to, even on days when you're, say, traveling. So like for me, I would always get stressed out if I considered a p productive morning routine as including training. If I was on a plane that morning or, you know, on a in a, in a cab going downtown that morning, um, or if I take rest days from the gym, I, I wouldn't consider it a successful morning routine. And so make the elements of, you know, drinking water, meditating, you know, journaling, whatever you do for your own morning routine, make that separate from your training. I, I just think that too many pe people consider the exercise part of their morning routine. And if life gets away, it's common to think that you've failed in your morning routine, which isn't necessarily the case. So that's helped me. And then to the previous bullet, I read some advice and I can't remember where it came from about shifting your priority of your day to taking care of yourself. That's the goal of the day is if you can take care of your health and your mental state, that's a win. And once that's out of the way, then you can take care of, of other people. It's the airplane mask analogy, right? So 
I just think too many people tr- do the uh, try to fit in a workout strategy when in reality it's one of the highest ROI uses of your time. And I think the same goes for meditation. So I try to have both my training and my meditation knocked out before 9 a.m. So then the rest of my day can be dedicated to helping others. And then it also makes sure that because I'm not worried about doing other things in the morning, uh, you know, the kind of like for my when I wake up to 9 a.m., the only thing I have to think about is taking care of myself. Um, that makes sure that I don't miss a session. So it's really easy to choose to work out and meditate in the morning when I know that that's the only thing I have to take care of and I have three hours to do it. That's so much time, you know, why, why, why would I not get it done? But I think when you, when you're conflicted between, do I answer emails or, you know, take phone calls or work on this menu or, you know, do, do any number of things, um, the, the last sentence in this bullet is try front loading your health as a priority. I'd be curious to hear how that works for you. I turned 29 this year and last year, I guess. I feel like 28 was the last year of being perceived as young. Anybody who's older than in their, anybody who's in their 30s can correct me if I'm wrong. So I share that I can reasonably expect to empathize with people that are 15 years older than me now, now that I'm, you know, in going from 29 to 30. And I say that because I've heard of 42 year olds that have great gym habits and they claim to feel like they're still in their twenties. And so I kind of, I'm projecting out what it's going to feel like to be 15 years older than how old I am right now. And the funny thing is too, that I don't, I, I hear about people who are 38 dealing with the challenges that I've already overcome. And so that's actually really reassuring that the next, like I'm, the age is, is becoming not a, just a number, I guess, for me now. And that gives me immense motivation to seek out long-term solutions versus short-term hacks because those habits will be with me for the next decade or two. And so that's kind of what I'm thinking about from an age perspective. There's an interesting quote that, you know, I kind of hobbled together from some Ryan Holiday-isms, but the quote is, avoid news, seek lessons. And I think... As the day that I'm shooting this is the 7th of January, yesterday was a kind of a crazy day in the news, and, you know, I'm trying to bring that into the content that I'm producing. So the Emulsion Podcast solo episodes shouldn't technically be a news show. They should be a show that's seeking lessons that come from the news shows, because I think if you want to kind of get clickbaity and kind of like be, produce potato chip content, you know, that's one way to think about it, but to find the lessons in the news. I think that's what I do really well. And so I'm trying to think about how can I do more of that with the news shows? Cause I fell off the train a little bit with the solo podcast episodes. Cause I didn't want the show to be gossipy. I didn't want it to be a gossip show where it's like, Oh, well, so-and-so is the new chef at this place. Now it's like, okay, what can we learn from the transitioning that's happened with this chef? If that makes sense. Next bullet is two solid appliance purchases that I'm really, really happy to recommend and that have been saviors in 2020 for me and lots of eating and consuming stuff at home is the Baratza Encore Grinder and the Baratza Encore Coffee Grinder and the Breville Smart Oven. So they're both on my countertops. They are both linked um, as affiliate links if you want to go check them out. And the reasons that I enjoy them so much is the consistent results and the adaptability between different projects. So the coffee grinder has the ability to go coarse or fine. Uh, Very, very consistent for Chemex coffee or AeroPress coffee. I can grind up to 16 ounces at a time, and it's really, really quick, too which I really, really enjoy. And then speaking about the oven really quickly is that it preheats really fast. It doesn't take for ages and ages to get to 350 degrees, like my big gas oven underneath my stove. And then it also has really solid settings for air frying, which I AKA call blast mode. And then also things like dehydrating, so it can go really low and keep the fan going. And for us in our place here, it fits near perfectly on a countertop in our kitchen. So it doesn't feel like a big clunky appliance. It just kind of feels like, oh, it's on the, it's on the oven countertop. I'm repeating a small input but big result part of my morning routine from a previous playbook uh, here because I think it's been super, super valuable for me, which is splashing my face three times with cold water when I wake up, and then I smile at myself in the mirror, which is like this weird uh, neuropsychological hack, and it it rehearses the mental stimulus of overcoming discomfort and changes your state by seeing yourself visually smile in the mirror. 
And for me, the cold shower routine is great in principle, and I've watched the Wim Hof videos and all that stuff, and I'm sure it has greater psychological effects than just splashing your face, but I know that I can stick with the splashing cold water in my face in the morning part of my morning routine. And I also just, everybody who I've watched videos on that does the cold shower thing stops because it's just not, you know, for me, the splashing with cold water on my face is the minimum effective dose for facing discomfort early in the day. And so if I can do that, then, you know, I've shown myself that I can overcome discomfort. So then when it's time to go train, it's like, oh, well, you've, you're the type of person that overcomes discomfort. So of course you're going to go to the gym. And then the same thing with having a difficult conversation at work or, you know, any, any things that come after that in your day. The next bullet is having multiple income streams is a life hack and investing in them offers benefits through financial security slash options, obviously by of course being different in industry than other forms of income. So in case that the market changes, like a lot of us saw in 2020, or if you want, even if you just want supplemental funds for other ventures in the good times, I think it's good to have multiple streams of income. It also gives you a new industry to explore. And, you know, so I give some examples. So playing chess on Twitch could benefit your mental clarity in your accounting job. Or selling leather straps on Etsy on the weekend can give you a break from your law firm job to provide extra money for a family vacation. So it doesn't necessarily have to uh, directly impact your uh, financial well-being. It can give you extra funds for these other things that you find value in. And a couple other examples is providing knife sharpening services could expand your network of chefs and more hands-on work than your sales gig, right? So as I see this kind of growing in popularity, I think... It kind of peaked in maybe 2018, the kind of like side hustle life. I just find that it gives me the ability to reach a greater audience who use cooking and knife sales and working with chefs as their secondary income stream. So I, in my head, think that my niche audience is kind of like culinary school students and line cooks and sous chefs. But as more people get their own side hustles, I'm seeing that they're starting to come into my orbit and get value from my content which is really cool. So I'm trying to keep that in mind as I'm creating content in 2021. I leave a quote here that is, free often ends up being the most expensive. That's from a really influential piece that I read from Tim Ferriss. It's called 11 Reasons Not to Become Famous. And I got a ton of value from that piece because I, in the social media world, personal brand, blah, blah, I think it's easy to think that fame is the goal. But, you know, I think the thousand true fans is something that I've shared in the past. And this piece, 11 reasons to not become famous, also really hit on a lot of things that I'm thinking about when I'm not necessarily going for audience size or recognizability on the street. I actually just want to like help the amount of people who already get me and who get what I'm talking about. Uh, so going the other way a bit on that. I share that I read a lot of Derek Sivers' work in 2020, and I engaged with him a few times over email as well. Really, really prolific and nice human. I just admire his love of life and kindness and creativity. So I recommend starting with his Anything You Want book and then absolutely pick up his newest book, which is on one of these counters here. It's called Your Music and People, which absolutely have his principles that cross over to the food industry. So if you don't like the title Your Music and People, I think it could just as easily be titled Your Food and People, and you would just get tons of value from it. Uh, if you've lost or had a hard time finding your circle of closest five influencer, influential people in 2020, I think you should try to use the internet to do so in 2021. So as much as it sucks to not be able to see people in person, this time, quote unquote, alone can serve as a reset for who you surround yourself with. So if you find that you in the past have had toxic people as your closest five people, you should try to find new ones and engage with them the most on Instagram and bookmark their websites and support them financially and teach the algorithms to show you their content more. So it's almost like the the reverse of that YouTube uh, watch later hack that I shared. And if I'm being honest, it's part of the reason why I share this playbook every year. If you want to consider me as one of your five people, I think that I... I would feel better being more transparent with you in sharing what I'm thinking about and working on going into the, the future because that makes you feel like we have a closer relationship and that you can then 
kind of see what's going on behind the scenes in my head, it's a little bit easier to um, relate rather than if I was just this person who published videos with, you know, inspirational quotes on Instagram. I don't think it's necessarily the same connection. And I just hope that it helps you be more confident about your goals and dreams and ambitions versus feeling like you need to be ashamed or embarrassed for having them. If you have issues sticking with goals, I think you should attach them to an identity to make them more to make them feel more close to the chest. So for example, instead of having the goal of read 20 books in 2021, you should add a subtitle, and I do this in my Notion dashboard, so the subtitle for that book reading goal would be become a prolific reader or become a voracious reader. So that's an identity that you attach to the goal. And I did the same with a few purchases this year, so it doesn't just have to apply to like... Um, mental or physical achievements, it can apply to purchases. So when I set out to buying a Fuji X-T4 as a goal, I attached achieve camera setup satisfaction to that, which made the purchase bigger than just a new piece of tech, right? So now an upgrade in the future requires me to admit that I'm not satisfied with my camera setup. Do you see how that, I'm trying to use these mental gymnastics and cues of how we talk to ourselves as a way to make progress on my goals. And then I, I share, with goals, I tag completed ones as either maintain or accomplished in my dashboard to keep them as a part of my goals sheet. Because I think it's common, or it's worth remembering that you've already accomplished a lot to get where you are. And if you've developed these habits, and I think you should acknowledge the fact that you're doing a lot of work to maintain those habits. And as you start to plateau in certain disciplines, it helps to remember this because if you get to a point where your goal list isn't really that long, you might become discouraged of like, I don't really have any other place to go. But if you tag completed goals and you see them every time you look at your goals of like, oh yeah, I still, you know, continue to be able to do 50 push-ups in a set, you know, that's nice to at least show yourself that you've done a lot of work to get to where you are. The next bullet is I took a wild and crazy amount of notes on Nathan Berry's piece that he wrote called The Ladders of Wealth Creation, and it's tagged uh, down below. You can also just search it. It's called Ladders of Wealth Creation, and hopefully you can see how I'm personally thinking about moving up and to the right on his ladder diagram. Uh, it just provided me a lot of value, and he, he spoke about it in a visual way that made a lot of sense to me, and it also kind of like... I understand why I was feeling like I had conquered something because I was only on ladder one, you know, and now I'm on, you know, somewhere between ladder two and ladder three. I don't necessarily know if I want to get to the place where I'm on ladder four in his framework, but I got a lot of value from it. So if you're kind of thinking about building wealth and creating wealth or moving uh, into a more leveraged place in your career, I think that you would get a lot of value there. And I share that the same goes for the work of Naval Ravikant. I've really been enjoying Eric Jorgensen's almanac that he made. I shared that already. All of the episodes of the Modern Wisdom podcast between Chris Williamson and George Mack on mental models are amazing. So there's four. There's four episodes, 101, 102, 103, and 104. Episode 104 just came out, and I feel like it has a few repeats, but it's still really, really fantastic. So definitely start with just Google search or just check the link in the article that I shared. Um, mental models between George and Chris on the Modern Wisdom podcast. The last bullet that I share is Noah Kagan has been crushing it on YouTube this year. It's really great to see him do that because I've been following him for almost five years now. And he does an interview with Tom Bilyeu of Impact Theory, and it was one of my favorite conversations I listened to this year. Not just about work productivity and, and success and thinking about goals and how to build businesses, but um, yeah, just life, being happy, you know, finding balance and being present and all that stuff. So, so he, there's two quotes that I'd like to share. Uh, from that interview. The first one is, quote, money spends once, knowledge and relationships spend indefinitely, end quote. That just like, I, mind was blown. It was a mic drop moment. And then the other quote is, quote, only those who get lost should give directions, end quote. And I think about that with myself quite a bit of, you know, I think the reason that I'm so focused on helping professional chefs perform better is because I know how it feels to not perform well. I know how it feels to suck in a kitchen. And I just, uh, if I can do things to help 
other people find clarity or perform better, I'm going to do it. And so that's, it really resonated. So nah, second to last section here, the last uh, one is just next steps to follow. So the, I just share a couple of newsletters and accounts worth following. So I'll just rifle through those kind of rapid fire style here as we close out. So James Clear's 321 newsletter is amazing. He just hit a million subscribers on that newsletter, so I'm not alone in really enjoying that that email every week. The next one is a guy that I've already mentioned. Chris from the Modern Wisdom podcast has a three-minute Monday newsletter, which is really, really good. David Perel has two newsletters that I subscribe to. One is called Monday Musings, and the other one is called Friday Finds. Both are really, really good. Um, just to find interesting content from industries outside of food that I really like, because he it digs really deep into tech and uh, writing and philosophy and history and kind of like world commerce style things. So I, I really enjoy his perspective and what he shares. Um, another one is the Brain Food newsletter from Farnham Street. I think Shane Parrish does an incredible job at interviewing and digging into the tactical things and mindset frameworks and his adaptings of mental models has really, really been inspiring for me. Um, a couple chefs that I want to share is Max Shapiro on Instagram only because I really like his food and he just has really good, honest takes on high-end food and wine experiences. It just because he doesn't have a restaurant of his own or he's not, you know, beholden to a specific publication, I find that he's very transparent in how he talks about, um, experiences in food and wine. And so I like reading his stuff. I'm going to share another uh, friend, Omnivorous Adam, Adam Witt on uh, YouTube and Instagram. I just, he's going to blow up soon and you'll love to see it. So uh, giving a shout out to Adam here is something that I'm going to enjoy looking back on. Uh, I really like how Nick Muncy uh, from the Toothache magazine has been sharing and shooting and styling food. So definitely check him out if you haven't already. And then obviously just every everyone that I've shared on the Emulsion podcast and that I'm going to continue to interview is just, of course, people that I think you should follow and support because I get inspiration from them. So um, next steps, this is the last section here. So you can absolutely support my content for just a dollar a week at justinconnacom slash support. And then with that, you get access to my online community that I'm really digging into building out this year, effectively taking Patreon out of the picture. I think that's not something that I've really shared uh, publicly with everybody outside of the Patreon supporters. So I'm taking the Patreon model into my own hands. And so I'm putting that on my own personal website, uh, more or less, so that I can do great gear offers and continue the conversation from videos or podcast episodes and do AMA style videos and pull you folks, uh, you know, post unboxings of the gear before the review video kind of thing is how I'm thinking about that platform. Um, so definitely check that out. Please, if you are listening to this as a podcast only, or even if you're not, and you've gotten value from the Emulsion podcast previously, I would love to have you leave a review on iTunes. I know it doesn't seem as helpful as financial support, but because podcasts don't have a discoverability thing, that's how it tracks is how, how are the listeners and subscribers enjoying the show? So it just shows the food section of the podcast sphere that you get value from this show. And it ultimately helps new people find the show and become listeners of this podcast. So I would appreciate that. That's linked uh, down below. Or if you're in iTunes and you listen on Apple podcasts, please just go ahead and leave a review. And the last request is to kind of just tweet at me or email me your thoughts on this whole thing, regardless of where you're reading or how you consumed it. I would love to hear your thoughts, what, you're, what you found valuable or what resources you might like to share with me based on the goals that I've shared. And that's, that's it. That's what, what you can expect from me in 2021, what I'm thinking about, what I'm working on, what I'm prioritizing. And I just thank you for letting me share this. Uh, I know that it's not... Uh, in particular, the content that a lot of people follow me for specifically. But as I'm starting to transition, I'm starting to see, oh, well, if I can perform better and prove that chefs can actually have a reasonable amount of healthy lifestyle and balance and prioritization of family, I can see myself wanting to teach that to other people. And so I'm using myself as the guinea pig first. 
and kind of trying to learn in public at the same time by sharing what I'm working on. So yeah, find links in the article itself. Uh, subscribe on YouTube if you haven't already because there's going to be a lot of great content coming soon. And we did it. You're in outro land now. Thank you so much. I appreciate your ears more than you'll ever know. Hey, by making it to the end, you're the type of person that I want to speak to directly. This little production is constantly growing. If you enjoyed this episode, if you like what I'm trying to do with this show and want to make sure more people can find us, a free way to help out that takes less than three minutes is to leave The Emulsion a great review on iTunes. If you didn't enjoy this show, please also leave a review. I'm happy to take any constructive feedback you've got. If you want to learn more about supporting this show with your hard-earned cash, patreon.com slash justinkana is the place to do that. I've got tiers starting at just $1 per month. Let's say you just like being involved through suggesting stories to be covered or asking questions to my interview guests. You can stay up to date by following along on Twitter or Instagram. That is linked up in the description for your convenience or always available on justincona.com. If you're on YouTube and listening, you can take this show on the go because this is available on all podcast platforms, including Spotify. And if you prefer video versions of things like my interview shows or the shorter intermezzo episodes and you're listening audio only, please check out my YouTube channel to see more of that. Now, as normal where I'd say my name is Justin Kana, and I hope you have a good one, but you've probably got another podcast episode to listen to, so I'm just gonna get out of the, out of the way here. Excuse, excuse me. Pardon me.